Uh, I'm going to ask all of our regular folks, can you join me and just give a royal welcome to our guests this morning? Can we do that? As Jim shared earlier, there's a, we have a gift for you out at the information table. We're really happy you're here. And uh, just pray that you'd be able to, to feel very comfortable and free to worship God, to receive from Him in this place this morning. I uh, really appreciated the public service announcement that, that uh, uh, Jim Cole gave, gave about fireworks and, uh, and safety. That was awesome. You reminded me of when, uh, when I was very young, uh, my father was trying to surprise us, so he had some fireworks and he hid them and uh, lo and behold, in the middle of the night, like three in the morning, uh, they, they, they caught, they, somehow they caught fire and, and began to go off in our house and he was, brought the hose in and he was trying to hose them off and, uh, and uh, so the, the, the addition to that public service announcement is never, he, he, he hid them in our furnace room, we have a gas furnace. Store your fireworks away from flames. You have just been given a great note of wisdom for all those of you who are celebrating the 4th of July in that way. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to invite you to take them and turn to James chapter 5. We're finishing up the book of James today. That's exciting. We're going through the whole book, and now it's our very last message from that series. We have two verses that we're going to look at uh, this morning, as you're turning, I would just want to say two things very quickly. One is that uh, we've been uh, announcing, if you are interested in finding out more about our connect groups, these are our small groups. Some of them have taken a break in the summer. Some are still going in the summer. But we have a meeting right after service. We promise you it'll be very brief. It'll be perhaps 15 minutes or so. But what we're, we're looking for is if you're saying this, if you're saying, you know what, I don't know a lot about them right now, or I'm perhaps interested in hosting a group, I'm perhaps interested in finding out more to lead a group, we're going to be doing a big push at the end of the summer and the beginning of the fall, but this meeting is kind of informational. You can come and, and uh, if you have any interest, perhaps some of you who are a part of our small groups would just come for 15 minutes or, or so, you might want to share a share what's going on in your group. That'll help those who are kind of finding out. So that's right after service today. And, uh, the, and it'll be right in here. We'll meet right over here in one of these sections, right at the front. Be very brief. And then I want to mention one other thing, too, that we're excited about. The end of July, on July the 28th, we're going to have for our, our seniors, our uh, golden agers, uh, a, a special day. Right after the service that day, in here, well, right after the service that day, our young people are going to be serving, you'll hear more about this, going to be serving a lunch to all of our, our, our seniors. You say, what, is it, what does it take to classify yourself as a senior? I received a special certificate from the seniors. I'm an honorary senior. If you don't have a certificate, you don't get the free lunch. That's all I'm saying. No, we're going to have a lunch for the seniors. Then we're going to come back in here and we are going to sing the songs that, that you love and hold dear, it's going to be an awesome time. So mark your calendar, July 28th, you'll be hearing more about that. But this morning we're finishing the book of James, we're finishing with two verses. And in order to gain an appreciation for where this letter, and that's what it is, it's a letter, how it ends, uh, James kind of has these two verses and just cuts off the letter. Just, it just almost feels like it stops abruptly. It's almost like they drop the mic in a modern day terms. He just like says a couple things, drops the mic, he's done. Two verses. And in order to get an appreciation for these, because if we think back, and I want to do that quickly, I'm going to ask you to give me your forbearance. If we think back, the kinds of things that the Holy Spirit has led James to write in this letter that he has sent out to all of these scattered uh, believers who were Jews for the most part who believed that Jesus is the Messiah. The church is very young. It's in its infancy. James writes a letter. He's encouraging them. He's guiding them. And in order to, to, to understand these last two verses, 
We need to put him in the context of everything he said. And if you try to gather what kind of guy James is from what he has written so far, I mean, he has pulled no punches. He has been as direct as direct can be. This is the guy that, like, if you want to hang out at night and maybe have a little party or a gathering of friends and, you know, you just want to laugh and it's going to be a light evening and that kind of thing, you're probably not going to invite James. But if you're hurting, if you're in trouble, if things are crumbling, if, if life isn't working, if the marriage isn't working, if, the, if, if there just seems to be things falling apart, James is the kind of guy that will come to mind first. You would run to him and you would say, listen, I need you to tell me the truth. Give me the truth and don't hold anything back. James is that kind of a guy. And so with that context and to kind of remind us, I'm going to go very quickly through some of the things that he has done, which seems like he's beating up believers, but we'll find that he's not doing that. But let's just look at what he said. To the one who doubts God, and this is to believers, to the believer who's struggling with their faith and they're doubting God, he says, James 1, 6, but when you ask you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. To people who hear the word but never let God's word change their actions, change their life, he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. To those who can't control their words. They're always sticking their foot in their mouth and maybe not in such a funny way, but in a way that is hurting people. James 1.26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. To those who are prejudiced and play favorites, James 2.9, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as law breakers. To those who talk in faith, but they don't walk in faith, he says, what good is it, good is it my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? He says, can such faith save them? No, the answer is it can't. To those who are envious and harbor selfish ambition, in their hearts, James 3, 15, such wisdom, he calls it this, quote, wisdom does not come down from heaven but is earthly, unspiritual, and he even calls it demonic. To those who want to try and follow Christ but still live in all the world has to offer, they're like, yes, I want to follow Jesus, but over here I can't give up all of these things. I, I'm struggling, James 4 for you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. To those who speak falsely about others, James 4, verse 11, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it but sitting in judgment on it. To those who are not generous, who withhold. He says, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. To those who put others down, James 5, 9, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. And to those whose promises are big and their follow-through is small. He says, above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. He says, all you need to do is say a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. James is not the lighthearted, funny, bring him to the party to tell some jokes kind of guy. James is saying it just like we need to hear it. And after you hear all this, you wonder to yourself, does this guy even have any kind of a heart? When I was, when I was young, I played 
it's going to be hard to believe looking at me, but I played football in the eighth grade, and I, I think I've talked before about the coach. Our coach was named Jack Stoll. He looked like a Viking. He had flaming red hair and a, this big red beard, and, and he seemed like if you were able to go in and, and look inside of his chest cavity, you wouldn't see a heart. It was like, okay, you'd probably see a big stone in there. And I remember I actually, in practice, we were scrimmaging, and I tackled the guy, and, and he, he, I hit his leg, and my arm snapped like a twig. I broke this right arm, and, and I was at the emergency room later, not even expecting this, beyond any expectation that I had, knowing our coach, knowing how he was, he was just hard and cold, and he was just seemed like that guy. He shows up at the hospital, and it shocked me, it shocked my parents, and he was kind, he was concerned. He was this person, it, just a side of him none of us had ever known, and it was, it was a total change. He did have a heart, like, like the Grinch, he did have a heart. And it was, a, it was a, big, a big change. There was something more to who he was, and maybe we just didn't see it. And when you come to the end of James, that's exactly what you're going to see. You're going to see the focus of all he's been trying to do, James 5.19 my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring back that person, bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sin. All the warning of James, all the wake-up calls, all the hard language, all of the, the direct hits to the believers, all of it comes from a heart of love and concern that the, the wanderer would be brought back to a place, sins covered over and forgiven, saved and set free to the glory of God. With that heart, with that understanding, let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, let the word of God change us today. And let nothing stop us from living like we really, really believe this word. To the glory and the praise of the Most High God. To your praise, to your glory, in Jesus' name, I pray that I would decrease, that you'd increase, and that you'd be so pleased by how all of us Run toward all that you have for each of us. In Jesus' holy name, the strong Son of God, amen. Amen. I want to look at three things today from this passage. The first one is the wanderer. The wanderer. If people, if I said to you, if I said to you, people can wander away from God. If I said that to you this morning, many of you in this room would say, Eric, sure they can. Sure they can. It's on, our, it's on our, our verse, it's on our scripture. Sure, people can wander away from God. The problem is that there are many people who don't agree that you can wander from God. James 5.19, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth. It sounds simple enough. What you may not be aware of is that this passage and other passages like this have caused theologians to fight over the centuries about what the Word of God means. And this fight is such that it is kind of pulling people in kind of one direction or another direction, and the reality is that there are numerous churches, numerous denominations, millions and millions of people around the world who believe one way and the same believe another way, and some don't not even really sure what they believe, and 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 so I just want to talk briefly about these two extreme or these two sides. One is reformed theology. You might have heard that word before, reformed. So yes, it goes all the way back to the Reformation. And uh, we might call it uh, Calvinistic or from, from a guy named John Calvin. And so their view is such that it was developed that people who are saved... And they have a term for it. People who are saved cannot be lost. 
They call it perseverance of the saints, or it's developed into, that's a way that they'll describe it, that people who are following Jesus cannot fall away. That's one of the beliefs. The idea is that they will and that they must persevere in the faith and in the obedience that comes from the faith. The idea is this, that until the end of their days, till they go to be with Jesus or until Jesus comes back, the thought of this reform theology is that whoever it is, they're going to keep fighting daily against sin and, and they're going to keep going and keep winning the fight all the way to the end. A man named John Piper, he's a well-known promoter of this theology. He writes this, there is a falling away of some believers but if it persists, it shows that their faith was not genuine and that they were not born of God. What he is saying this, there's really not a falling away because in their view, you can't fall away. And so if you did fall away, you were really never following God in the first place. And so it's really not a falling away. But if it seems like it, you're just seeing this person who really wasn't chosen or elect or predestined to be with God. One of the foundational verses of the Reformed theolo theological view is Romans 8.30, and those he predestined, he also called, th to those he called, he also justified, those he justified, he also glorified. The person who's really staunch in this view says that the one who's saved will always be saved. They cannot not be saved. They're going to persevere till the end. Another way to say it is this, that humankind is so sinfully depraved that we could never choose to follow God on our own, but that our, our state is such that God's grace, his irresistible grace, his unmerited grace, is so powerful that if we are one of the chosen ones, we will respond and that we can't resist and we won't fall away. On the other side, there's another view, and the other view is called the Arminian view. And the Armin Arminian view comes from a man named Jacobus Ar Arminius, and he was one of the opponents to, the, to Calvin's views. And here he says a number of things which we won't get into everything, but a couple key things to consider is first that the atonement of Christ, the work of Jesus, wasn't just for the predestined or the, the people who are elect, but it's for everybody, he says. That's atonement's for everybody, but that some will choose to follow and some will not choose. He sees it as a choice. It is the choice of the person. So some of the, the thoughts are, listen, if there is a place where we don't have a choice, then, then if we run around and we can't choose, then and if we're going to be saved and, and because we're elected, and if we're not, then we're not, then, then we don't even have any reason to try. And so they say that's not a good way to look at it, so they don't believe that there's just some, it's, it's atonement for everybody and then man chooses Theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer gave a title to something he called cheap grace. He writes this, grace without price, grace without cost. The essence of grace, we suppose, is that the account has been paid in advance and because it has been paid, everything can be had for nothing. He talked about this because of people who maybe perhaps took for granted this Amazing grace that some on the reform side would talk about that if you're saved, you're going to be saved. And so if you're saved, you can live any way you want. And he's saying, listen, that's really not a good way to go. That's a cheap kind of a grace. And now we've looked at a couple sides, but what I want to say this morning really, really, really in an important way is this. That we together are going to look at a couple verses and not let a doctrine or a theology inform what we think God is saying through the Holy Spirit, through James, to the people in his day and to us today, 
but we are going to go to the Word of God and let the Word of God today inform what we believe about truth and doctrine and living and following Jesus. Don't start with the doctrine. Start with the Word. And so this morning we're going to look at the Word and I want you to look back at James 5.19 and with that kind of an understanding of these different sides, James says... Let's put that aside and look at the word. James says, my brothers and sisters, my brethren, fellow believers, followers of Christ. He's saying, brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, if one of you should wander away. If. Very important. We wish it didn't happen. It does not have to happen. But if... It happens that someone wanders away. There's an if, and that's an important word. So if this happens, and what it happens? This wandering. The word wander means to be deceived. The word wander in the original language means to go astray. You're on a path, you get off the path, now you're led astray. You're deceived, you're going in a different way. If that happens, if you are in error, it means that as well. I want you to see this same word in context in a few different places in the New Testament. Jesus uses it. Look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 12. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, there's the word. One of them wanders away, goes astray. Will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that has wandered off? It's gone astray. Matthew 24, 24. Jesus is talking about the last days. When he's talking about the last days, he uses this word. He says, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive. It's a different form. It's the same word. To lead astray. To bring error into the mind of, to, to take and help someone move off of the course if possible, even the elect. Then Hebrews 3, the Holy Spirit speaking. Holy Spirit is speaking and the writer of Hebrews says, verse 10, that is why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So there is a wandering, there's a going off course, there's an error that James is talking about that believers fall into, and then he says, they're wandering from this thing he calls the truth. Well, what is the truth? What do we mean by the truth? It could mean truth in different contexts as well. But here in this context, in James, it, it fits with how that same word is used elsewhere. It seems very similar, John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Same word, John 8, 31. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if, I, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's the same word used in a context of freedom. Paul uses it, Ephesians 1, 13. You also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So coming back to James chapter 5, Verse 19, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, if we set aside all of our preconceived understanding and all of our preconceived belief and we take what James is saying through the Holy Spirit to us this morning, we have to say that he's talking about two believers, about believers, and if one of you, one of the believers decides that they're going to go astray or they begin to go astray and they are now in error, they're deceived, they're walking away from this truth, it seems pretty clear that this is the truth of the gospel that saved their soul. Here we have someone walking away and no matter how we define it, this morning, church, no matter how we define it. If we say, you know what, they're wandering away is such that they were really never saved. Or if we say they were saved and they're wandering away, we would all agree this, that the word of God is clear that wandering from God, 
wandering from his truth is never a good thing. It is clearly an evil and a wrong. And, and James is saying, listen, we need to turn around the wanderer to bring them back to life. And so, no matter the theology, the idea is Christians whose life is getting cold, their, their, spiritual, their spiritual pursuit is off track. Luke 8, 13. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. Jesus is teaching a parable, parable of the sower, and he says, they believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. 2 Peter 2, 20 says, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and again are entangled in it and, and are overcome, they're worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. The point is this, there is a pattern in the Bible where people can somehow stray and wander and fall and go away and the heart of James is to wake up the church and to say that he loves you and me through the Spirit and through this letter and that God loves us through this today to say, listen church, we need to know wandering can and does happen. He doesn't want it to happen. You say, oh no, and I, listen, this morning I want to say this, that God does not want fear to rule our lives. You say, how far is too far? I mean, how far do I wander before I lose my salvation? How far is too far? What I want you to know today is that the love of God is more powerful than any of us can ever begin to imagine. The grace of God is so matchless. Listen, it's not like, we you know, tomorrow we did a little thing and we're, we're not saved. There's none of that that's being talked about this morning. Uh, Paul even wrote it. He said that he's convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the present or the future or any power, height, nor depth or anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. God's love is so great that we're not talking about worry over walking out of God's grace. He is able to keep us by his great power and love. But James wrote a whole letter, whole letter warning people about the different ways that we can get tripped up, we can go off, and we can can go astray. And rather than say, I wonder how far I can go before I've gone too far, what we should say is, I wonder how close I can get so I can experience the fullness of God in every way possible. God, how close can I get to you today? I read a story about this Geraldine Largue. She, she hiked the Appalachian Trail, and this, this poor woman lost her life there. And, and when they they found her, they found her some two years or so after she'd passed away. They found she was less than two miles off the trail, but she tried for a month in vain to figure out where she was and get back to it. She was that close to the trail. Listen, I don't know how far is too far, but we shouldn't be thinking about how far is far. We should be thinking about how close can I get to live in the fullness of God. So the first thing this morning that James, through the heart of love, is saying to the church, through the inspiration of the Spirit is, wandering does happen. It can happen to your neighbor, it can happen to your son, it can happen to your mom and dad, it can happen to you. Then there's the second thing I want to talk about, and that is the rescuer. The rescuer, being a rescuer is a grand assignment. It's a grand thing, it's a good thing, it's a powerful thing to be a rescuer, to bring hope and freedom and life. James talks about this. I read, I read about Operation Thunderbolt in 1976, actually July the 4th, so this week, 40, what, 43 years ago, on July the 4th, uh, what had happened was an Air France jet was hijacked. Many of you remember this. It was flown to Uganda by Palestinian terrorists. The Israeli Defense Forces got on the ball right away. They do Operation Thunderbolt. Through, through the darkness, they flew some 2,500 miles there. And in a 90-minute mission, there was like 248 
hostages. This is a, a passenger airliner, 248 hostages. They let go the non-Jews. They kept the Jews. But the Israeli Defense Forces in 90 minutes delivered 103 of those. They, everything was turned around. It was a great and powerful rescue. What do you do when you rescue? You put everything on the line. Their lives were on the line. Everything was on the line. The, the ones who were safe went to help those who were caught. And they went, did everything. They risked so much to go help bring them back. When we talk about rescuing a wanderer this morning, I'm just going to say that there is something that happens. It's the Spirit of God working in the church. But listen, there is a personal cost if you say, you know what, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do something. Sometimes you have to go to a place where you care so much. It's going to put, it's going to cost you something personally, but it's the heart of James and it's the heart of God to go out and to help somebody come back to the Lord. Look at James 5.19. My brothers and sisters, again, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should, look at what it says, bring that person back. It's interesting. This is not a command. He is not commanding us to do this, but it's the heart of God. The greatest rescue mission of all time is when God took on flesh. And now here's the heart of God coming through James saying, we too, you know, we can bring people back. God saves, but we can help in this. This is an awesome truth. Someone brings that person back. James uses that same word, or that same idea twice. Look at verse 20. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way. It's the same idea. Turns a, sin, a sinner from the error of their way. You know, you play pin the tail on a donkey when you're a child at a party and they blindfold you and they spin you around and then the person is going absolutely the wrong direction. And, and finally they're waiting, everybody's laughing. And then somebody has compassion on the poor person who can't get anywhere near the donkey and kind of steers them in the right direction. It says, now go. And now they have a chance. Somehow, through the Spirit's work, the compassion of God working through the people of God to bring the rescue of God to your friends, to your kids, to your parents, to your siblings, saying, God, I want to be part of the one who has enough of your heart to go and to love them. Listen, this is a work of, a spirit, of the Spirit, Galatians 6, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. What's happening? You're going to love them. You're going to gently turn them. Gently is the idea. Listen, this is not abrupt. This is not harsh. And here, this is really important. The, the eyes and the heart of a person who is feeling the spirit at work in their life. And I just want to say this morning, really, God wants this of all of us in this room. It's not a command, but all of us in this room should have a heart like this. And here's the difference. Sometimes when a person falls, when a person wanders, when a person is off track, what do we do? We look at them with the eyes of the police. We look at them with the eyes of the judge. We look at that person as the eyes. We look down upon them. They failed. They made that mistake. Look what they did again. And, and it's the wrong eyes. But the eyes of a rescuer are different. The eyes of a rescuer look at that person and a heart of compassion goes out. It is the Holy Spirit, a heart of gentleness. And it takes work. It takes personal sacrifice. It is a risk. But you go and you begin to gently Turn them back toward God. And then what happens? Number three, the reward. I'm going to invite Nathan to come on up and play quietly, if you would. James 5, verse 20. Remember this, James says. Remember. Call to mind. Don't you forget, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. More literally it is, will save a soul from death. 
You say, I can't save anybody. You can't. God can save them. God alone can save them. But God lets us have a part in the grandest thing of all to help turn them back to hope, salvation. And it says to cover over. It means to hide. Think of all the sin maybe that they're going through at that point or what they're doing or all the things that they might do in the future had they never turned. All of it, what does it do? It gets hidden away, covered over. It's forgotten, cast into the sea, forgetfulness to be remembered no more. Why? Because somebody, God used somebody. God, God stirred somebody and you looked and you saw and that person is not in a good place and so you reach out gently through the Spirit's work bring them back. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, above all, he says, love each other deeply. Church, it all, everything we talked about this morning and all of those hard words of James as we close out this letter comes from this idea of a deep love that comes from, from the, the throne of God to his children. It is love for each other. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. And so the rescuer gets a reward, treasures in heaven. Treasures stored up in heaven. Where moth and rust don't destroy, where thieves can't break in and steal. Treasures stored in heaven. There's a reward. And then there's the person who's rescued the wanderer. They get a reward. Why? They have eternal life. They have newness and freshness and, and freedom and life again. They're, they're free. They can feel like that, that junk is gone and they can run once again. The reward for both is great. As we close, I want to talk to you uh, about one of my earliest memories my earliest memories was being picked up by the police. It's a good memory. I was picked up by the police. I had, I had wandered off. I had strayed off. And I wasn't far from the home, but it was at a playground. And to, I was having a ball. I just decided I'm going to go over to the playground. It was around the corner, across the street, not that far away. My mom had no idea I was there. And so after, I don't know, an hour or two, some amount of time, a police officer comes by and picks me up and says, hey, you know, ask me my name and says, hey, come on with me and drives me home. And I was like, great, hey. The first apprehension by a police officer. And uh, to my surprise, my mom, who's in tears and, you know, worried, had been looking with my sister and she got the neighbors involved and my parents and my friend and and then, of course, the police are involved and everybody's, what are they doing? They're looking for me. Probably people in this room, you've had a, maybe a similar situation. Everybody, I find out, everybody's looking. Wow, I didn't know I was that by Everybody's looking. And they care. People who really had no business caring about me, like my mom, my sister, people who are, are concerned or, and then they're in the search. They're in the fight. They're in the rescue. How much more? How much more should we, every one of us, everyone, if somebody goes astray in any way, have a heart of love and care and concern and, and join in the rescue to the glory of God. But do it with the Spirit's leading. Do it with gentleness. And turn that person back. And I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes there are family members, and if you have a family member who's gone astray, you know that a prophet's without honor in their own home, and sometimes the hardest thing for you to do 
is to be able to help and minister to somebody in your own family or somebody who's close to you. What do you need? Sometimes the biggest blessing of all are other people, other believers who do have the ear of that person and the heart of that person and can get closer. Listen, we need one another to make and see this happen. So we're going to pray in, in, in two ways. I'm going to pray, pray for the wanderers, pray for the rescuers. This morning, as we close, if you're with me, our heart is this. We'd love to make a commitment as a church to do everything possible. If we feel that there's any wandering going on, that we, doesn't mean we lost our salvation, but we want to just do everything possible to say, you know what, I don't want to drift further. I want to get closer to Jesus. I want to get closer to God. I'm going to do everything possible to get closer. There might be some of those that are far off. So the other thing we need to do is commit together to be rescuers, join in together, to do all we can. It starts with prayer and then service to see that person turn back, that person saved sins covered over to the glory of God. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes?